I'm Lara Downs. Welcome to this panel. So glad you could join us. Um, this panel is called Considering the Flipside, and we're going to be talking about recording, sharing your music from different perspectives. I'm a pianist, um, former Sphinx Medal of Excellence laureate. Um, been recording for a while now, so I know a thing or two, I think, about um, what it is to be adjusting to changes in the industry. With me, Damien Sneed, who's also a pianist, also a Sphinx Medal of Excellence laureate, and um, you do so many different things. I'm going to ask you to introduce yourself. This is Sean Hickey, who is a composer, and a wonderful composer, and a Detroit native, and vice president of Noxus of America, and what else? Semi-professionalized theater. I don't know. <laughs> Will you guys give a quick introduction to your own quick history in recording and experience? Um, my int uh, experience in recording, uh, I've recorded with a couple of uh, well-known mainstream recording artists uh, and tried to record my own project. Had a lot of meetings with major labels and nothing ever happened, so that pushed me to create my own label. And that was grassroots, so I learned a lot. Uh, then I finally got uh, real distribution through a major label. And then I went to school at NYU for music business to get a better understanding. Uh, and so now I have a couple of projects that I'm doing, but I still will do them on my label, just uh, partnering each project with a different uh, distribution company. Uh, but I do a lot of different things, yeah, so musically. As for me, um, wow, that's loud. Um, as a composer and recording artist, I got my start here in Detroit, but uh, my work really didn't kind of um, find its home until I moved to New York about 20 years ago. Um, but in my role at Noxos, I handle the um, sales and marketing and distribution of over 700 classical record labels throughout the world. And um, you know, we represent some 12,000 artists and my job in that uh, company is to, you know, facilitate, you know, the music that you hear, wherever it may be in the world, however you choose to consume it. And um, I think we'll talk a little bit about uh, some of the models that labels are adopting and that artists are adopting. Like Damien said, starting his own label, starting his own company, these are some of the options that didn't really exist for most of us 10, 15 years ago, uh, and they're now really, really proliferating. So I was joking yesterday with Abigail that we could have called this session, there are no answers, only questions. Um, you know, I think that since I've been making records, which is over 10 years now, there, I mean, everything just has been changing so fast. I feel like, for me at least, I'll say that I feel like I know more about what doesn't work than what does work, and we're just testing the waters all the time to figure out what the future is, because the future is, so, is changing in so many ways. Um, by the way, we want to keep these mics open for your questions throughout this panel. So we're not going to leave time at the end. So at any time that you have a question, either submit it through Slido or just come on up to the mic. This should be more of a, a conversation than anything else. Um, for me, I guess, you know, my, my start in recording was just kind of one of those lucky breaks that you get when you're a kid. And um, I made my first two records with a label that is now long defunct. I knew nothing about anything. And I think that was really the last gasp of the days when um, there, there were some structures in place that don't exist anymore. I mean, for example, I remember doing an in-store performance in a Tower Records in uh, Manhattan. So are there even any Tower Records in Manhattan anymore? I don't think so. Um, <laughs> and uh, then some years later, I, I did a few self-produced projects. I've worked with um, several smaller labels, and I'm currently just in the final stages um, I have a, a launch of my, my first album with Sony, which is coming out next week. So it, I kind of have um, experience, I guess, across the board. I wanted to start, um, oh, the, the title of this, of this panel, considering the flip side, I'm launching another label, like a, a real one. Because the first time I kind of just made some music and put it up on CD Baby, and it was fine. Um, but later this year, I'm launching a label called Flipside Music, which will be distributed by Noxos. And I think that the purpose, the goal there, is really just to you know, dive in and try all these things that we think might work in a future, in a digital future, and really not try in the th any of the things that we know don't work. So you know, do we have to make 
albums, CDs, not really. Can we just make music and you know experiment with different formats and putting it out there quickly and seeing where it can go in terms of playlisting and streaming? Yes, we can, and I think that's what I, what's interesting to me. Um, but I want to just take a second and show you what I've been doing with this Sony release, which is a Leonard Bernstein project. And um, when I first envisioned the project, one of, one of the things that I really like to do with my music is tell a lot of stories around it. And I've been frustrated with the format where you put out an album with a press release and, and then that's done because I always feel like there are so many layers with any project that I do. So I just want, so I had this idea of putting this out in a serial form, like you buy a, you know, a Netflix series or a series on iTunes. And so that's what we've been doing, and we can talk, Sean and I can both speak to this, um, the successes and, and challenges of this. So this started now three months ago, because we have 12 episodes, and we're going into release week next week. So if you'll just help us walk through this. So you go to my website these days, and you click on this link, and this takes you to a whole landing page for the album. Um, if you, if you look over on the right side, we've got places where you can sign up so that we can harass you in perpetuity. Um, going down, 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 and further, and further. So he, this page houses all of these episodes, which include every week, because I'm crazy, um, videos, podcasts, and single, single tracks or bundles of tracks. <coughs> so this episode 10 came out last week. Um, just will you quickly scroll all the way down to the bottom? You'll see just how crazy I am. All these 12 episodes. These are all, you know, these are all different tracks on the album that, that really do have different stories around them, different collaborators. And so, you know, it's been a lot of, a lot of material to put out. Um, Sean, maybe can you speak a little bit about how that's been received on, on your end of the distribution world? It's been received, I think, with some uh, pretty tremendous interest. Um, a lot of people don't know what to do with with this kind of thing. I think the concept of a serialized release, I don't necessarily like that term, but I think we all understand what it means. It's just a release that uh, you know comes out over a period of time, like you know, you're doled out a TV show or something that you subscribe to. Um, and um, I think it's something that we'll see more of in the recorded industry in the year, uh, in the coming couple of years. Um, I sit on the um, NARIS Committee for Classical Music at the Grammy Awards, and um, we had a pretty heated discussion uh, when we met last on what to do with these releases. Uh, when is street date? Is it when you start a first episode or when you you know, have a, a completed project and all that, and we're kind of working out the machinations of that. Um, as our tastes and um, consumption patterns change with music, there's nothing that says that um, a release has to be the sort of fixed thing with a date, because we, in sales and marketing, I represent, we, my company released 6,000 recordings last year, um, and they're so many of them are non-events. A date comes, and then they it kind of goes by, and we work up, you know, a, a lot up to street day to really kind of, you know, create some emphasis and and some um, opportunity for the artist and the label. Um, but then then after that, it's really kind of a uh, pretty steep decline uh, of new new releases. So this is a way to kind of keep the sort of um, sort of project in the in the public's uh, eye and ear for a longer period of time. Uh, we work very closely with Apple Music and iTunes, as you can imagine, uh, and they constantly emphasize this idea of moments. Moments are things that happen around a release or around an artist or whatever it is that you're doing as a content creator uh, that ensures that your project, whatever it may be, lives beyond this particular launch of a recording. And what we're talking about here really kind of emphasizes different moments across a longer period of time. So I think what I've learned from this is that it, this was really sort of obvious to me. As somebody who spends a lot of time on airplanes, for example, I buy a lot of Netflix series. I don't think twice about it. $20 for something that I can't even have now, it's like a, a business <laughs> expense. You know, I'll buy the thing and then I, it will come to me as the episodes um, are released. And so for me, it made perfect sense. You do this with music and, you know, you have the same kind of buy-in. And I don't... At this point, I'm, I'm not sure that that's true, and then that raises questions for me about how we 
consume music? Do we think about music these days the way that we think about a TV show? Do we think about it as something to acquire and have? Maybe not, because it's always just literally streaming past us. So I think that this is a big question, and you raised this when we were kind of talking through this panel. Um, what, how, how is music consumed? Why do people get it? You know, what do they get it for, and, and do they want to keep it? Right, or do they just want to experience it and let it go? And also, I think what I don't know about, and Damien, I kind of am curious about you, there's clearly a lot of money being made by virtue of people not owning music. This is something that I'm still puzzling over. So do you have any thoughts about that? Also, please, questions, whatever. Yeah, that's very interesting. Uh, I was reading yesterday, I'm a member of a couple of blogs, music business blogs that Warner Music Group uh, reported that in the first quarter, they made, I think it was over $1 billion, and that's the first time that's happened in 10 years. Uh, the record industry has been like a dinosaur with the long tail going down, but actually things are getting better for the recording industry. It's on the upswing. But this is very interesting. Uh, she's talking about episodes. I found out from releasing a lot of albums, uh, if you don't have a big machine behind you, it's expensive. You know, paying for radio, thousands of dollars a month, paying for, you know, all these fees when you do it yourself. But it's interesting, I found out that it's best to release a project in moments if you also have uh, performances, something large set up around it. So it's interesting, uh, I do have a couple sponsors, but like for example, I'm gonna release a project called The Three Sides of Sneed, Classical, Jazz, and Sanctified Soul. So I'm an artist in residence at Bard this spring with three, three performances, one is classical, one is jazz, one is Sanctified Soul. So I'll release uh, little EP singles online through certain uh, uh, you know, s digital media outlets that way with each performance, but then on June 30th, that'll be the full project launch. And this is interesting, because uh, when I finish, I'm gonna uh, throw it back to them, especially to you, I, this is, I, I'm curious. But on June 30th, I'm uh, doing the three sides of Sneed, classical, jazz, and sanctified soul, all at one time, 30 minutes for each genre as the main artist at Central Park Summer Stage. So I have different people coming with me. But this is the, this is the issue, and I'm, I'm on the fence with my publicist and my team. I understand the value of releasing a project into the stream which understands it. You know, classical, jazz, you know, jazz labels, you know, soul or gospel labels. Uh, but my mentor, Winston Marsalis, was very intriguing to me because he you know, won the Grammy for classical and jazz at the same time. She's doing a wonderful job. If you look at what she had with the episode, she's collaborating with other people. Everything is starting to come to the collaborative arts. I'm not sure whether I should release the project on my own, uh, own label and just see what happens, or if I should try to find a way, this has never been done before that I know in the history of the recording industry, find three labels or three major labels that will offer me distribution with this project that's gonna be like a big tri CD compendium. Mm -hmm. But you know, it's interesting because now they're blurred lines. Yeah. Yes. Absolutely. Well, and that's the thing because you know, when I'm putting these up, the tracks on this album are so different one from the other, and the, the collaborators represent really different worlds. So this all lives together on one physical CD, but in terms of you know playlisting, I, I have no idea where, where the stuff will end up. It's, it is so, it's, and sometimes, I don't know if you, you probably track your Spotify streams, I try to, and you know, you'll notice that your, the, the bulk of your streams on a track are coming from a playlist that you wouldn't even have imagined, you know, totally different genre or, yeah. I would say that, um, you know, just to kind of jump on, on some of these points here, the thing that we talk about in, uh, in the digital age of music consumption is that access is more important than ownership to the vast majority of us. And most of us carry around in our pockets these incredible things of unbelievable processing power that have the world's music at your fingertips for a very low price or no price. And um, the reason that the record industry has seen a bit of uh, uptick in the last 18 months or so is the unbelievable proliferation of all of these services in your lives. And um, so Warner, Sony, Universal, Noxos, everyone else uh, is as a result of this. For years we um, you know, kind of pegged our profitability on a fixed format that had a fixed cost and that we knew if you bought a CD in a store for $10, you know, the distribution company, the label, 
and all the way down to the artist in that sort of uh, content supply chain was compensated for that work. In the streaming era, um, you know, the industry is fighting and the PROs are fighting, ASCAP and BMI are fighting on behalf of all of their composers, authors, and publishers uh, to improve the rate among the services. There's a lot of talk, there's a lot of drama, there's a lot of, uh, a lot of things happening on Capitol Hill to fight on behalf of the uh, composers and authors out there. Uh, though, of course, Capitol Hill is kind of busy with other things. <laughs> or are they? Uh, and um, so, you know, we have this, like, very, you know, big patchwork uh, industry right now that we didn't used to have. Ten, 15 years ago, you sold a CD. And you had that CD at Tower Records. I got my start here in Detroit at Harmony House Records right up, uh, right up Woodward um, 25 years ago. And they had 40 stores in southeast Michigan. And the record store is... Uh, you know, a bit of a dinosaur in this world, but we have this like, diversity of access being more important than ownership. So I think that's, you know, we can really have the ability to do a lot of things that we just could not do before. And really the kind of onus and the opportunity really starts with the artist, not with the label. And the stories that we hear here, what Laura and Damon are, Damon are talking about, are, um, are stories that we could not have had just a few years ago. We have a question. Yeah, we have a question from Slido. It, um, Naya who plays cello would like to know um, how do you feel about music streaming through internet radio such as Pandora, Spotify, and etc. Um, in what sense? Oh, hi. So I've heard that. So. I've heard that when there's music being streamed through internet radio, such as iHeart, Pandora, and Spotify, like every 10 songs, they only get like one penny or something. And, and this, this is just what I heard that, you know, like the fairness and like of, um, you know, like uh, of money to the artist that created the song is not totally, you know, fair. Yeah, these are the checks we get for like $2.45. That's <laughs> amazing. <laughs> yeah. yeah, so I was wondering how, you, how do radio, um, um, recording companies and artists uh, fight against that, um, that um, stream, that like the low money streaming? I'm happy to answer that if you have a couple of hours. <laughs> um, <laughs> so um, there are uh, ter traditional terrestrial radio, when you put on the radio in your car or your home. Um, is uh, you know kind of been the lifeblood of music for a uh, hundred years since the birth of radio. Um, there are two countries in the world that do not pay content owners um, on the broadcast of their work. Those two countries are Iran and the United States. And um, so that music is you know that you could have a, a huge hit on whatever the most popular station in any given market. There's no real compensation to you. Uh, however, the era and the introduction of web radio changed everything. And that does have an administrative body that governs streams or governs plays. And then uh, adding all the other services like Sirius, Pandora, iHeart, and the others um, allow an industry to track what is being listened to online. Uh, so I'm sure everyone here knows it, but it doesn't matter where you are in the world. You can listen to whatever radio station you want in the world, provided they have a, a web component, and the vast majority of them do. Um, and um, there are opportunities for people to get paid um, for that. The company that administers uh, those payments to um, rights holders is called Sound Exchange. And Sound Exchange is a large organization that also didn't exist 15 years ago. Uh, now they're administering the payments uh, to an enormous variety uh, of artists out there, and uh, they include the services that I mentioned before. And um, this is something that, you know, for as tough as it is to really make a living as a, you know, as a content creator in this world, you know, at least we have Sound Exchange administering on behalf of labels and artists in that. So if you do have recordings out there in the marketplace, there is money for you provided. Sound Exchange is making those payments to the labels, distributors, and then making it down to the artists. We have questions, but I'll just really quickly tell an actually happy story about that. I hadn't done my paperwork until a couple of years ago. My sound, it's really, it's a pain in the neck, that paperwork. Um, and so I finally got myself organized with Sound Exchange, and then I got a 
check for many thousands of dollars. Actually, I mean, there's no going back a good ways. But the yeah. exact same thing happened to me. Yeah. I didn't know about Sound Exchange. I thought when you release a CD through CD Baby at that time, it just happens. And I registered, and then all of a sudden, I got a check for thousands of dollars for multiple recordings. So if you have CDs out there, you need to go register like right after this. <laughs> no, really, because that means yeah. there's money out there for you, possibly. Wow. Um, Charles Murphy, <laughs> St. Louis. Um, what happened to ASCAP? And uh, now I see sound exchange making a lot of sense. Um, physical CDs have become serial releases, et cetera. SD cards, uh, what's happening with them? Because, uh, uh, what is it, Black Magic Design has a unit that'll produce, that'll copy 25 at one time and you know, with a new format. So it's like distribution could be uh, SD. Uh, we got streaming. And the only other thing I'll say real quick as far as getting paid, I know there's a model with apps. If you create an app, you can, you get somewhere in the neighborhood of uh, 30, you get a, a bigger percentage, 10%. There's something in there. If you create an app, and uh, it goes on the app store and it sells. They got a whole structure, you know, w with a much higher uh, percentage for the creator of the app. And I'm wondering if you can kind of foresee something like that happening with great music. I guess the only thing, I think you have more to say about this than I do, but the, the one thing that I've noticed is that um, the, the, the physical CDs still exist very much as a co point of contact between artists and audience. So, you know, I've played around with the idea of finding some cute, cute way to sell music after shows, you know, SD card, whatever it is, a QR code. People really do want to take home the CD. Um, so as many CDs as they press, I will try to sell them at shows because <laughs> there's nowhere else to sell them. And also they make good coasters. <laughs> ASCAP is a PRO that he mentioned before, performing rights organization, ASCAP, BMI, CSAC. Uh, I get checks from ASCAP as well, but uh, it's not the same as Sound, sound Exchange. I, you know, and then it's, I didn't realize if you don't have distribution through one of the distribution companies or labels that's, a, that's like in this secret uh, brotherhood, sisterhood, like I didn't realize this. You can release stuff and, and you know what I'm talking about. Like, for example, you can release a project and it'll never reach Billboard. It'll be considered for Billboard. Like, if there's, a, I can't think of the sound scan, the, the, you know, that's well, sort of archaic, but certain things that labels do for you. So, if you don't have a major label behind you, then you're pretty much just doing your project yourself. But once a major label puts you in the system, that's what they told me, you know, then. You 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 have more access to stuff, but uh, sometimes with the ASCAP, I know ASCAP. I'm with ASCAP. I don't know if you're with ASCAP or BMI. But ASCAP, that's for your own material, right? Your own. Yeah, for things that you write, and so yeah. that's why if you're doing classical, I'd suggest that you do arrangements, yeah. if possible, mm -hmm. so you can get some money. Otherwise, you're not going to get anything except as a performer. Right. You know. Yeah. Yeah. Next question. Hi, my name is. Um, Matthew Jamal Scott, I'm a double bassist uh, and composer. Uh, my question is, if you're just starting out um, trying to release a project or some music, what would be the ideal format, like the ideal platform to do that? What would you suggest, Spotify, iTunes, et cetera? It really depends on what you uh, wa want to do. Those, aren't, uh, those are platforms that are gonna carry music without prejudice. So if it's available, it's on there. If the distribution entities are doing their job, uh, the, 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 your work is on there. The question maybe before that is, do you want to do something on your own? Do you want to release your own label and do the work required there? Um, I don't have, I, I assume that to be on a label, you have to have funds, right? You have, you have to pay to be on a label, correct? Po possibly, you performed yesterday. Very great, good performance. Thank you. Thank For you example, much. Thank you. For example, you missed a great opportunity. Uh, you could have uh, used your social media and had Andre Dowell also say today is his single release. Right. And it could have been on iTunes for, you know, 99 cent. And maybe you could have had physical CDs and signed CDs afterwards mm -hmm. for 2 or $3. But 
like she said, the best time to really sell CDs is at a performance. But if you're not on a label, you can talk to him, you can talk to me, you can talk to other people about s seeing if they'll pick you up, if they'll help you with the EP. Maybe it's not a recording deal. Maybe it's just they'll get behind your project and help you. So that's a good thing to do. Can I just ask, how many of you in this room have recorded music on your own? I'm just sure. Yeah. That's very good. There are one that I want to just break down that answer into one kind of simple thing because we get asked, I get asked probably a dozen times a day for many years, this is my project, will you do something with it? And the answer to that is, um, I'm afraid for all of us in this world, a big no. We need to know what the motivation is for a project. We need to know why it's important to you, uh, why it's passionate. It has nothing to do with one's talent has everything to do, I mean, we're assuming that everyone is uh, infinitely talented and worthy of a recording in the marketplace. Let's just have that assumption right away. If you've gone to the uh, extent of, of contacting, you know, a label or someone, then you obviously are proud of your work. Um, the, but, you know, you really need to look at uh, uh, putting together a whole project and being able to most succinctly describe that project. I don't mean a track listing and who's playing on your, on your record and who the sidemen are, but all of what it is that you know, makes it unique, including biographical information, tour dates, we look very, very closely. This is the question we get asked every day. What are your socials? Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, on and on. What are your socials? You know, do you mo mobilize and motivate people to come to your shows, to you know, engage with your work? Labels are looking at that. A big, strong, detailed, but yet succinct proposal on what it is, uh, why it's important to you, and how a label might make money is, is really the most important thing to start with. This sounds like a really sad story. I don't mean it to be. I don't mean it to be depressing, but I think it's a sort of a reality check. The day that I signed this project with Sony and all the paperwork got done and it was all finalized, I realized that I didn't feel at all the way I had felt, whatever, you know, five years ago when I had signed a much less important deal. And I realized that, that the feeling in my head that day wasn't like, yay, I'm going to make this record and I have a big label behind me. It was, okay, I have so much work to do. And it, it, it did make me kind of sad for a moment. I don't know if it's just because I'm old and, you know, um, jaded or what, but it's, it, it's the reality. It's that I think any project you do, and no matter how you do it, if you do it yourself and you get it up on CD Baby, if you're working with a major label, this all rests on the artist now. And that's, you know, that can be overwhelming. You can look at it as a challenge. You can look at it as an opportunity. In the meantime, I mean, I think this is a tremendous opportunity that I wouldn't have ever had at any time before to do something like this and tell, do this kind of storytelling, generate this kind of energy around a project. This only exists because of the, the digital space that we are starting to inhabit and social media. And, but I mean, I've been working around the clock for, for a year on this project. I'm, you know... The, if I'm not working on a video or a podcast or, you know, working with the distribution team, I'm on my socials, and it's just been a tremendous amount of work. Sorry. <laughs> Question. Good morning. Uh, my name is Kinu. I am a composer. I write for films and TV shows. I'm based in New York City. I have a question about distribution. So... I travel around the world a lot. I just spent the last year traveling to five different continents. Um, and my question is, how do I sync them all into one? Because I want to do a performance in maybe New York City and have people all the way in Shanghai listening or people in Paris tuned in so that, and I'm not on a major um, record label or I'm not you know, tuned into anyone who's specifically looking for me, but I'm definitely ambitious enough to do it on my own if that's what it takes, so I just, I know your thoughts. Um, I travel a lot in and out of the country. Uh, social media is the best thing you have. Uh, if you get followers. Mm -hmm. China uh, doesn't have Facebook. or Who doesn't? China. Yeah, so with China, uh, you would just probably have to do more grassroots or find a publicist in China if they, if they uh, will allow you to do that. I, I hate social media now. I never thought I would hate it, but I really don't like going on it because... Uh, Sometimes you get too many people, you know, asking you because people will look and they'll assume that you have great opportunities for them because and they don't realize how much you're <laughs> struggling to to continue to just have that energy. Yeah. 
you know, and and I'll go places and people will be like, oh, you know, you did this, and, and so I don't really like social media. However, I have a great publicist, and she forces me. No, you have to post. You have to do this because it's important. And a, m major labels will be very upset if you're work with them and won't won't post. But I was gonna say, just use your social media, do digital releases, you know, uh, and that way it can be in every country because then you have to deal with certain countries that will pay a certain amount for the CD and certain that you won't get royalties. But I, and then you have to, grassroots is the best thing to me. Even with a major label, taking CDs with you, taking an extra suitcase and paying the hundred dollars if you need to, and bringing two hundred CDs and make sure they don't get cracked or get, uh, uh, forgot the other type of case that I oh. prefer. <laughs> yeah, it's the yeah. The digi, yeah, digi-pack or something, yeah, I remember, yeah. But yeah, that, that's my suggestion. Use your social media, like you said. I would also say on that, I mean, this is the thing that um, <coughs> presenters are always struggling with. They have a great artist in town, in their hall, doing this great thing. How do they take that experience away from the people that are there, just sitting? And uh, thankfully, we have tools now that we didn't have before. So you're performing in New York, and you want your fans in Shanghai to experience this in some way. Um, you know, web streams are very, very common and, and uh, important now. There's a lot of platforms like Periscope and others uh, where you can do a concert and make it available. Uh, this very talk is being streamed, I believe. Um, so, you know, there's uh, you know there's certainly opportunities there, and and I feel very strongly about it as a composer myself, uh, is that, you know, you go to an event, you have a big premiere, there's a bunch of fanfare, you have a great time, you meet all these people, and man, that hangover is like instant, <laughs> you know? Like, it's over, and you were there, and in that, and you were in Copenhagen, it was great, and you had fun and met all these people, and everybody outside the world, outside this little community that was there, didn't get to experience. How do we take, recording is a way to kind of bring it out of its, of its, um, you know, sort of geographic limitation. And then I think the other thing is just all the options for web streaming that you want to try to explore if you can. Okay, thank you. I have another question from Slido. You mentioned the distribution supply chain where the artist is the last person to get their cut. Are we in the age now where artists don't need a middleman? I'm going to go ahead and say this on the record since it pretty much is on the record, but uh, yes, there are um, more and more opportunities for artists to bring their products to market directly and through TuneCore and a lot of organizations that can at least get your product up on the major services, at least in the, on the digital services, um, that there are options for, uh, for individual artists without the label without the distribution mechanism. Um, but I would say this, that you know, your work is not going to get out, the world, got, get out in the world without some sort of mechanism of distribution. Um, we're dealing with bits and bytes here. Um, Apple Music, iTunes changes their spec roughly every four months. We have to deliver 2.4 million tracks to, Amazon, uh, to um, iTunes every time they change that spec. And is that work that you would want to do on your own? And it's very, very minor little technical things that they, that they deal with. And, um, you know, that's, that's really kind of the, the, the thing that, that is really important. I would also stress one other thing. You know, we talk about music consumption and how we're, you know, we have these devices and we're on, you know, taking a run or working out or whatever. And you listen to a playlist and you're just kind of dipping your toe in. Ah, I don't like that track. I'm going to go past it. I'm going to go... It sounds like you're consuming music. This is, this is a term that the industry uses, I think everybody, consumption. We consume music. Well, music is not a potato chip. We like to think that it's something more than that. Um, but yet, our habits are indicated that we're not really uh, engaging in the ways that we were a few years earlier or a generation earlier. We're really just streaming and dipping our toe in the water all the time. So as artists, I think we really have to think about that and it's really hard if you're, you know, a classical music performing artist of jazz. I mean, these are, you know, genres of music that require commitment, and most importantly, they require time. And in a society that doesn't value time, how do we kind of break, break through that in this sort of streaming playlist-oriented type age? I think that's, the, that's kind of the hardest thing for all of us to grapple with. Hi, my name is Amanda Kemp, and I'm a spoken word artist and playwright. And um, <clears throat> I've collaborated recently with my husband, who's a violinist. 
we have a world premiere coming up in April, and so I'm just starting to think about, wow, the whole idea of episodes, like how to use this to launch that, and um, and I'm all, and I've also been around for a minute, you know what I mean? So I'm also like, it's it is exhausting to do it all, to be the artist and the everything. So I guess I'm wondering, um, maybe what would you say about what kind of team um, you would create or you think to help you so that you could be more of the artist and less of the everything else? Like if you could say two or three positions or roles that you would pay out. Yeah, no, that's a great question. And it's something that I want to talk about too is you know the question of investment. Where do you spend your money when it comes to recording? So for me, um, doing this project, previous projects have taught me what I'm good at and what I'm not good at. And I'm really good at having the big ideas and kind of um, telescoping them forward. I'm really not good at organizing on the micro level. So for me, honestly, the most important thing in all of this is to have somebody who helps me by keeping a spreadsheet with, you know, to do items and when, you know, so when is episode nine due and what does that mean? When do I have to deliver this podcast and all of those little things? If I try to think about those, my mind spins out of control. So I think really break it down. What are you good at? What are you not good at? Find the things you're not good at. And it's, um, I think, you know, kind of big, big ticket items like publicity, break that down too, right? Because you don't need just a publicist to do your publicity. Figure out what are the pieces of PR that you want to do and what can you do yourself and what do you need some help with. And sometimes I think if you really break everything down, you'll find that the things you need help with are small things that you don't have to pay that much money for. You know, you don't have to pay very much money to somebody to keep a spreadsheet for you. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? Does that help? Your thoughts, Heather? Uh, for me, I now a publicist. I remember last year I said a publicist only. Um, I still don't have management because I don't trust someone managing something that didn't generate or come out of themselves. How can they manage something that's not theirs? That's a, you know, managers are needed at a time when you have a lot of things that you can't do on your own. But I just, I'm not gonna give somebody a cut out of everything. What I do have is I have friends that help me in different genres and they help me as assistants so I don't have to, they're the middleman because I don't have time. Time is very valuable. Time to talk to everybody to do bookings. You know, I'll make the initial connection and then if it's something big I have people that, you know, agents that do that. But I'd say a publicist and a social media person is important. Someone that can respond because people don't like it when you don't respond within two minutes. They don't like it when you don't respond to an email within uh, yeah. 10 hours, it used to be 24 hours, you know, by the end of the day. And then also if you can find someone that's a graphic designer that is a friend of yours that would like the experience of doing, you know, performance uh, flyers and all those types of things, and then maybe getting work through your relationships, that's important. Because I have a friend that I can just hit him up and say, hey, I need this flyer done by tomorrow. And well, I shouldn't say this out loud, but I will. And I can pay him $50. You know, where it, the work is worth 350 or $400, but it's a relationship and because he knows that he's going to get bigger clients. And that helps because on social media, like, look at, if you look at her episodes, it takes work to do the website. Then you have to have a web designer. I, can, I took classes for that, but there's not enough time to be creative and artistic and do business, you know, yeah. and have life and then try to do everything right. yourself. But, I mean, a team is, is absolutely necessary. It just kind of depends how you define that. I mean, people... There are people who are fortunate to have friends and family who they can call on. I mean, at this point, with my performance and recording work, I, I have an incredible management team, and I'm so grateful because I honestly couldn't function without that. Um, but there are a lot of things that you still do yourself. I mean, you do yourself. Like, I'm really control freaky about my socials. I don't want anybody really posting on my behalf because I'm really picky about my words and my images and stuff, you know. Yeah, is that helpful? I would say one small thing, just maybe as a spoken word artist or uh, an artist in general, is that, you know, I don't have quite the team. I mean, I have a team at Noxos, but my work as a composer, I don't have a team. Um, I do most of the stuff on my own. Obviously, I want to spend more time writing music and less time promoting it, but that doesn't work that way. Um, I hired an assistant several years ago. I pay her a bit of money every month. She handles all of my correspondence, mails out scores, mails out recordings, corresponds with people, sometimes negotiates with a presenter in Europe or something like that, it's the best money I've ever spent. I don't know why I didn't do it earlier. And some months I look at it and I think, like, I'm paying her a bit of money, and I didn't really give her anything this much. She answered two emails. 
that's not really worth it. But you know what? It's just uh, such a, a saving grace for, for me. So. The mic on. Yeah. Project. <laughs> My name is Emily Kidd. I'm a recording engineer. I don't know if Shadow can hear me. <laughs> <laughs> uh, the battery is dead or something. <laughs> um, and basis. Um, I wanted to know um, with a lot of young people in the room and graduating college, they're already kind of financially strapped. Uh, what's the best business structure for independent artists? Wow. Uh, the best business structure, it depends on the genre of music that they're doing. Uh, it, he said, what is the best business structure with all the young people in the room for setting up a label and setting up publishing? Uh, I found out because you know, when you're, when you believe in yourself and people keep saying no, that's not a time for you to get depressed or, you know, yet, you, you know, or feel like, oh, I'm not this, I should just throw in the towel, just quit. So I created my own publishing company. I created my own label out of those reasons. But now I love having my own publishing company because I, I'm a composer. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm writing opera for Lyric Opera Chicago, doing a commission for the Kennedy Center. Uh, I've done some stuff for Metropolitan Opera Singers. And, and now the way, people are buying the sheet music online, it's just like, wow, I'm getting all this money myself. Now the difficulty is I've got to now get an assistant because mm -hmm. it's coming in high volumes. You know, it's a lot with printing and the paper, but but wow, like, I, the money, it will pay off. If you put in the work, you, you'll eventually see the payoff. And another thing, when you're young, everybody's not gonna be, uh, a, uh, I shouldn't say that because he's not that young, but a Bruno Mars, you know, Age is just a number, but you can't think that if you're young that you have to get a Sony contract. She's been working for a long time at this. You know, I've been working a long time. He's been working. Your, your work will pay off. It always does. I want to say one kind of general thing that I have heard so much over the years, and I feel like it's um, a problem for all of us for the, on, on all sides of the industry. I think that as an artist, whenever you're recording anything, you need to really think about why you're doing it. You know, um, one of the problems in this market is oversaturation. I mean, there are how many recordings of the Beethoven sonatas, right? Every time a person goes into the studio to record the Beethoven sonatas, I think they should be having a really big conversation with themselves about why they're doing it. And um, the words I hate so much to hear, and I hear them all the time, is um, are. Um, calling card. Well, it's a calling card. It's a, you know, what is that? I don't, I really don't know what that means. It means that now you just recorded another version of the Beethoven Sonatas, <laughs> you know, and you spent money doing that and you're putting another, another version of the Beethoven Sonatas on his plate and, you know, you're cluttering up Spotify and maybe your version of the Beethoven Sonatas is amazing, but just to think it through, I think especially when you're really young, why am I doing this? Am I making this recording because it will help me get more concert bookings? Am I helping? I'm making this recording because I can send it to you know, to put to managers and agents. Am I making this recording because I want to put it up on YouTube and become a YouTube star? Whatever it is, but don't just do it because it is such an investment of time and money, um, and you know, and and just a lot of hard work. Great answers. <coughs> My name is Ulysses Saxton. I'm a musician, songwriter, and composer. I have a question about trying to create more engagement. I really like the idea of the show, uh, of TV shows and stuff, especially with, say, shows in, like, CW. They've basically cross-platformed all of their shows, which is genius for making more engagement with everything. I'm working on a project in which it's kind of like an album or it's a series of which each song is a different emotion, but they all have very similar concepts, uh, and then they all, basically, you listen to one song, you listen to love, and then you later on will get the rest of love and hate and you'll get a little bit more of something in different emotions. That's what I'm working on. My idea is, or my question is more so, rather, how do you create more engagement in, in knowing which audiences to put your, inf your music out? That way you can also get them to check the other stuff out. Mm -hmm. uh, there, there are certain uh, uh, apps, that, and not just apps, there are websites, I can't remember them all right now, that you can go to. and and check your numbers and see which audiences. What I love is YouTube videos and the insights, mm -hmm. and you can see the demographic of the age group, whether it's females between 30 and 45, 
uh, that are watching and what time of day they watch. If you pay Google more, you know, for that. Google statistics, like, and the insight, like, what time of day, how much of your song they're watching. And it's interesting, even with videos on Facebook, you'll see that people will only go a minute into your video, and then they move on. Because, so that's a really good way to know. And then sometimes if you can just ask your fans, or try, if you're doing a, a, a performance, try something new. Like, if you're doing four shows, try, try four different new songs and, and see how the people respond. And like, she, she made a great statement. It's important, I'm, I found out now, Having a CD is not good enough when you have a lot of performances. People want to hear what they heard that night. Mm -hmm. So it's important, if you're doing performances, you need to have a recording of what you're performing. Because just having yeah. a CD or an old CD, or it could be great. It could be have you know m major other major recording artists, but people want to have that experience and take it home. Yeah, so what I do now is when I have the new album, after shows, you can buy the new album for whatever it is, $15, and then like you can have all the others for a dollar. Because I just, I, I just want to keep them going out. But it's true. People want to hear what you're playing now. They really don't care what you did two years ago. <laughs> I would not uh, uh, overstate the influence and importance of YouTube on any of our lives. It is the single biggest disruptor in the lives of any creator of music in anywhere in the world. It's as simple as that. YouTube is ginormous. I, I always tell the story, and I, I don't know, maybe it bears repeating. I sat down five or six years ago or so with a rather prominent pianist and, you know, coffee, phone, coffee, phone, or whatever, and we're talking about music and, and asked, she was asking some of the similar questions here, and, and I said, well, how do you, you know, how do you listen to music? Do you buy CDs? Do you download your iTunes? Do you listen to Spotify? She kept looking at me strange and all that, like, you know, what are you talking about? And I'm like, well, how do you, you know, how, wh what's your primary mode of music listening? She said, well, YouTube, of course. And I'm afraid that's true for a lot of people. Um, the YouTube stars in this world, the U YouTubers, YouTube artists, uh, dwarf Taylor Swift and everyone else in influence and follower numbers and how the music community can tap into that. A lot of it is completely inane, stupid stuff, in my opinion. My, my son watches other people play video games. Who the hell would want to do that? Well, he does. Uh, and, <laughs> and these guys have 20, 30 million followers. So what is the music community doing to like really build this kind of thing? And these guys are good be, in one uh, respect. They do more than Taylor Swift because they're always posting always doing something. They're never not in the public eye. I, I just had one more question. Um, so I have this business model I'm working on. I'm curious what you think about it. Basically what I would do is look for, so <coughs> I'll preface it with this. Um, when looking through my analytics and using certain different things, LinkedIn, Instagram, certain things like that, it's basically like depending on the area, the people, when they're looking for new people to follow, they're always sort of looking for that person that could be their kind of new in a way you could say start. It's like, this is the person. Sometimes I have people from Indonesia, and they're like, you're amazing, where's your album? I don't have that, I'm just a random person making stuff. I'm not there yet. But, so it's like they're looking at you as if you're gonna be this thing, and they don't know you in the context of like what your life is going through. So the question is, the idea that I've come up with is that I'd go to smaller communities, basically become their person, their guy or something like that. Then I'd leave and I'd pack up and go somewhere else, become their in-house person. And I'd uh, repeat that process to a certain amount of areas. I was looking at basically going to a certain city and picking their second largest um, town, and then that's where I would do it. Not the largest one, it'd be too difficult to get that through, and, but the second largest, po possibly. I'd go to the second largest one and then become their main music person, doing multiple different shows there. Then I'd get as many followers as I could from that area and keep packing and going to different areas. At some point when I'm doing a bigger project, they're super invested in you as if you're their star, because it's like, I've put so much into you. Uh, what do you think about that idea? I think that sounds amazing, and it sounds like a lot of work, too. Mm -hmm. Like, because you would have to keep that relationship going. Constant that's time. the thing. Yeah, I mean, I think that, and, and that's something that we get, we can do as touring artists. You know, I think that wherever you go, you, what you are doing is building your base, building relationships in a real sense, you know, and, and so any model you can think of that, that uh, maintains that relationship and allows you to have continuity there. So, you, you know, you're not just gone and forgotten that you're, and you can, you can uh, maintain relationships with presenters where you've played and, you know, keep 
keep communicating with the list of people who were at your show, sending them new music and everything like that. And I think that that's, that's really a, a perk of the job. Thank you so much. You, you said you don't have an album. You should have an album. You can do an album for $100, $150. You can use an app like Artisto or just a picture or just a picture of the carpet. That's your cover. One inch by one inch? No. You can. Uh, they have sales at CD Baby. I'm not sure. TuneCore price, twenty nine ninety five to put the project up. If you've ever auditioned for any orchestra or a school, you have to have a quality recording. You can really make quality recordings on an iPhone or an Android, or you can buy a special attachment microphone. And it may not be the best, but it's something. Start somewhere, and you can have a project out by Monday. Well, it won't be on online, but you could do it by Monday. We've got Single. to wrap up because he and I both have to leave. I just, before we go, thank you both so much, and thank you to Sphinx for having us, and thank you all for all your great questions. Um, thank you so and much. I just, I want to say too that I think this is a time of tremendous opportunity. It's really exciting the kinds of ideas and control and energy artists can have now. You've got one more question. Um, one real quick one. Yeah, go, go, go real fast. I just, y'all just reminded me when you talked about YouTube. Um, there are things out there called CDNs, content distribution networks. One of the early ones was Ustream. I got in and I'm grandfathered in. I can create all kinds of channels and stuff. Live stream is out there. There's tons of them. Yeah. But Ustream saw, Ustream didn't start letting you do streaming. But when they saw the other CDNs mm -hmm. getting in on it, they, they got in on it. So that's a good place. They got your own analytics, all your data and everything is there and all of your uh, job structure, all the different things that need to be happening, they got them, and they will teach you how to do it as well. Okay, thank you. And what did we learn today? Music is not potato chips. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for coming, Amen. everybody. Thank you.